Um, so uh, I think some of the things I'm going to talk about have been introduced a little bit, um, but I think I'll go into probably a little bit more detail. I've focused really here on the gliomas. I'm not going to talk about the other uh, pediatric brain tumors. Um, so the overall objectives uh, that I'm going to try to cover is to try to give you an appreciation of some of the advances in our understanding of the genetics of pediatric glioma and what are the key differences between uh, what we see in the pediatric age group compared to what we would see in the adult age group. Um, to try to give you an understanding of the role these molecular alterations play in the pathogenesis of pediatric glioma and in some cases how we may target those therapeutically. Um, I will briefly touch on, although Ari um, also talked a lot about this, what are some of the potential methods we have for implementing these molecular diagnostics in the clinical lab, um, and to try and develop an approach to combine that molecular and morphologic information uh, to generate the pathology report. And I'll show you a little bit, at least from the pediatric perspective, how that new molecular information uh, for gliomas has been incorporated into the revised WHO classification. And again, David gave, obviously, a fabulous introduction to the whole principle behind that. Um, and I'll try and just focus that down on, on the pediatric practice. So I'm going to start with the high grades. So sort of the first half will be high grades, and then I'm going to talk about low-grade gliomas in the second part. Um, so in pediatrics, like in, in adults, by high-grade glioma, we mean WHO grades uh, 3, or anaplastic astrocytoma, and grade 4, or GBM. Um, a, uh, a difference from the adults is that in pediatrics, um, the high-grade gliomas are actually less common than the low-grade gliomas. So you're much more frequently going to see low-grade gliomas in a pediatric practice. And another, I think, important difference is that these are usually not the result of a progression from a low-grade glioma in a pediatric population. These people present primarily with, a, with either an anaplastic um, or a GBM. Um, and they are very molecularly and biologically distinct from their adult counterparts. And I think um, the distinction between a grade 3 and a grade 4 uh, in the pediatric age group is also um, less important from a prognostic perspective. Uh, so main important difference, um, IDH1 and IDH2 mutations, as well as the 1P19Q co-deletions, are rarely found in pediatric gliomas, except in older teenagers. Now, you will hear about, I had a case that was 10 who had this, but by and large, under the age of 15, it is very unusual to find an IDH mutation or the classic 1P19Q co-deletion. So instead, what the pediatric gliomas have, or most frequently have, um, are histone mutations. And this was the landmark paper published by Nada Jabato's group um, uh, several years ago now, where uh, using whole exome sequencing of a series of pediatric high-grade gliomas, uh, they found mutations in the histone gene H3.3, as well as some of the other chromin remodeling genes in pediatric GBM. Uh, so what are these histone mutations? So the gene they found to be mutated is called H3F3A. Um, that encodes for a replication-independent histone 3, the variant 3.3. And they found two mutations in that gene. So um, one at uh, K27, where it, um, it becomes a methionine, and the other at G34, where it becomes an arginine. Um, and I'm going to try and use this pointer. Or not. Sorry. Um, sorry, where's the button? There we go. Okay. Um, so just for, for those who don't remember sort of the histone biology, histones form this octamer, and DNA gets wrapped around those. And uh, many of the histones have these tails that stick out, so it's kind of hard to see this, but this says H3. Um, so there's two copies of H3 in each octamer. Um, and on these tails, there's a number of predominantly lysine residues, which can be uh, modified. So the sort of relevant lysine residues we're talking about here, here's the K27. Um, this can be acetylated or methylated. Um, and depending on uh, the acetylation or methylation status, that sort of tells um, the, the DNA should be open or the DNA should be closed. In other words, you should read that area of the DNA or you should not read that area of the DNA. Um, the K36, or the lysine 36, which, uh, which is just uh, obviously two residues away from this G34, is thought to be what's influenced um, by this mutation. And again, this has important uh, implications for how the DNA um, is read uh, by various transcription factors. 
Now, uh, not reported in the initial paper, but subsequently uh, reported by Susie Baker's group was a second histone gene. Uh, this is the HIST1, H3, B, or C. Um, and this, in fact, encodes for a different histone. This is a replication-dependent histone 3 variant 3.1. Um, and this is only found the K27M uh, mutation. And these are largely found uh, only in the brainstem, um, whereas uh, these mutations are found uh, throughout the, the midline or the hemispheres. So, and I think Ari alluded to this, but if we look at um, sort of where these mutations are found, we see some really interesting patterns. So this yellow ball here is showing you the G34 mutations, the H3.3 G34R. So about 20% of hemispheric GBMs in pediatrics will, will harbor that mutation. Um, whereas if we look in the midline, we basically never see that. In the midline, instead, we see this K27M mutation, and those are just uh, the blue balls. So uh, in the thalamus, it's about 50% of high-grade gliomas. In the pons, it's considerably higher, almost 80% if we include both the 3.3 and the 3.1 mutations. And then again, in the spinal cord, um, high-grade glioma is about 50%. So overall, it's sort of an interesting biology in that K27M seems to be a midline disease, whereas the G34 seems to be a hemispheric disease. And obviously, from a basic science, and sort of tumor genesis perspective, it raises all kinds of questions about cell of origin and what, um, what are the differences between the cells that are going to form these midline structures versus the hemispheric structures that are going to make them susceptible to mutation in one um, histone gene or another. Um, if we look at when these occur, there are also interesting differences and sort of sometimes hard to see the difference between the, this blue and this purple. Um, but this dark blue is the K27M mutations, and you can see that these really peak during early childhood. And so into the teens, you can still get them. And there is this long tail out. So as Ari, Ari mentioned, uh, you can get these uh, out into adulthood, um, even into the 40s and 50s or 60s. Um, but by and large, the peak of these are occurring in um, somewhere between 5 and 15. Um, if we then look at the G34s, these are the, this is the red line. Um, you see that while these sort of start to come up, and, and in a pediatric practice, we see these in teenagers, uh, in fact, uh, the, the majority of these are actually happening in this um, sort of young adult population, so people in their 20s and early 30s. And the green line here is where you're seeing the IDH1. So it's less frequent than IDH1. It doesn't have as long as a tail of IDH1. Um, but if you have a, a practice where you're seeing a lot of young adults, it is something to consider if you're seeing IDH1 negative tumors. And then this, uh, this lighter purple that's sort of going off into the distance is obviously the wild-type tumors. Um, so just a very little uh, bit more about the histone biology. So I said that histones are really important for packaging and ordering DNA. Um, so one of the sort of big questions is how do mutations in histones uh, lead to cancer? And I think we don't really know the answer to that, um, but there's a lot of sort of interesting uh, potential questions. So I showed you this picture before. Um, again, here's this lysine 27 and the lysine 36, and, and there are different modifications that can be put on those. Um, so what, what do we know about this? So again, this is showing you the tail. This is the lysine 27. Um, and we know that there are uh, a number of enzymes that are important for either depositing uh, methylation marks um, or removing those methylation marks. So the main one to deposit the methyl mark onto this lysine 27 is the PRC2 complex, and the actual methyl transferase is called uh, EZH2. Um, and then it's this UTX or Jumanji group that is important for removing um, those methyl groups. Now, there's also a number of important, um, uh, so in addition to these writers and erasers, there's obviously a number of uh, proteins within the cell that then read those marks and determine whether those genes should be expressed or not. So what happens when you take um, a cell and you put in the mutant histone? And that's just what I'm showing you here. These are Western blots. Um, this is an immortalized normal human astrocyte population, and you see a similar thing with lung fibroblasts. Um, so this is just a wild-type histone being put in there, and this is the mutant histone. And what you see is that that trimethyl mark on the H3K27 disappears when you put in the mutant histone. And that's the case in the, in the astrocytes, and it's also the case in the fibroblasts, and that happens in virtually any cell line that you put it in. Um, if we look at human tumors, we, see that we can see the same phenomenon. So here's a wild-type GBM that's been stained with an antibody that will only see the trimethylated lysine 27 on histone uh, 3.3, or all histone 3s. 
Um, and here's a, a GBM that we know has that mutation. And again, in here, there's some normal cells, but all of the tumor cells have lost this trimethyl mark. Um, so the thing that's interesting about that is that this is telling us that not only is the trimethylation lost on the mutated lysine, um, but it seems to be lost on pretty much all of the lysines on the histone threes. Um, so it's some kind of dominant negative effect. Um, and the mechanism behind this has at least partially been worked out, and this is work from David Alice's group, where they showed that um, this K27M mutation actually leads to a direct inhibition of the EZH2 enzyme in the PRC2 complex. And so, obviously, if you have a methionine where you're supposed to have a lysine, you can't put methyl groups on it. But what this is doing is it's somehow trapping that EZH2 on that methionine residue and not allowing it to move along the DNA and keep depositing methyl groups where it should be on the next lysines. And so what um, you end up with is overall sort of more open um, DNA. Um, and this is just a cartoon uh, uh, showing that idea. So here's the lysine 27, um, which you know, has the trimethyl mark on. The PRC2 complex normally hops along here and keeps adding it. That means that this part of the DNA should be shut down. Um, in the presence of the mutant histone, it sort of gets blocked from doing that. And now what you have is all this open DNA that you shouldn't have had before. And if we look um, at uh, cells where we've put that mutant histone in, um, we see that what, that what that leads to is hypomethylation of DNA. So the DNA is now uh, not methylated at lysine 27. It stays more open. And it lose, loses also DNA methylation, um, uh, which tends to go with the, the histone methylation. So that's just what this is showing here. So the blue um, being hypomethylated regions, um, highly associated with the presence of this histone mutation. And if we look at the level of gene expression, we see that, in fact, there's a huge increase in gene expression in the cells when you've added uh, this um, mutated lysine 27. If we look at human tumors, we see the same pattern. So this is human tumors um, that have the K27M, and this is those with wild type. And you can see, again, that there's global hypomethylation in these tumors that have this um, lysine 27M mutation. OK, just a little bit about the G34R mutation. This has actually been less, uh, less studied, so we don't really know the mechanism. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, this is a hemispheric disease. Um, although it falls into sort of the category of GBM, there is a histologic overlap with P and ET, and whether the histology of, or whether the behavior of those that look morphologically more like P and ETs is going to be different than those that look morphologically more than, like GBMs is sort of unclear. The, uh, it's thought that this G34R will affect this K36 trimethyl mark and that there may be a mechanism similar to what we see with um, the K27. The G34R mutation is mutually exclusive with H3K27M, so we never see these two together. And we also never see them with IDH1 mutations. Um, and interestingly, like the IDH1 mutations, this is highly associated with TP53 and ATRX mutations. So um, in terms of your ATRX and your TP53 immunopattern, uh, it's going to look very similar to an IDH1 mutant astrocytoma. Uh, so this is just some pictures of that. So again, from a just pure morphology perspective, about 75% of them will look like a GBM, and 25% of them can look like PNETs. Um, they may have GFAP expression in the ones that look more glial, but they can actually be very weak for GFAP. About 90% of them will have diffuse, strong immunohistochemical staining for P53. And about 95% of them will have lost ATRX on immuno. Now, interestingly, as uh, sort of different from a lot of the other high-grade gliomas, they actually typically don't express OLIG2, which we sort of think of as a glial marker, but these ones usually don't express it. Um, so from, from just a pure practice perspective, again, because of this sort of overlap in morphology and in some of the immunoprofiling with the IDH mutant tumors, and there's an overlap in terms of the age of presentation, it is something to think about if you have a young adult with ATRX loss, P53 mutation that does not have an IDH mutation, just think about the possibility of G34 mutations. Okay, in contrast, as I mentioned, H3K27 is a midline disease. Um, H3K27 is thought to lead to the loss of this trimethylation on the, on the K27 across the entire um, uh, genome. 
It's mutually exclusive with G34 and IDH mutations. Um, the association with P53 and ATRX is there for K27, but it's actually much less strong than it is with G34. So about 60% of cases with K27 will have a TP53 mutation, and about 15% will have ATRX. Now, this is age-associated, so if you tend to see older children and adults, then you're much more likely going to find ATRX associated with K27, but if you're looking at a kid under the age of 10, then the presence of ATRX is much less likely. Um, Ari already mentioned there's a very nice antibody now available to the K27M. Um, it does have its um, potential uh, caveats in terms of interpretation, but overall the antibody works um, pretty well. Um, as a backup for that, if we have cases where we're not sure, uh, we have a digital droplet PCR assay that we use uh, to try and detect the K27M, and this would also be the way we look for G34R because there's no antibody available for, for that one. So if we look at pontine gliomas and we look at, um, and this is the sort of centered in the pons type tumors, and we look at how often are they associated with these histone mutations, there's some sort of interesting patterns that come out. So if you see a diffuse pontine glioma that looks like a low-grade astrocytoma, um, about two-thirds of those will harbor a histone mutation. Um, if it looks like an anaplastic astrocytoma, um, it, the interesting increase is that more of these tend to have this H3.1 mutation versus a 3.3, but overall, again, about three quarters will have a histone mutation. And if it looks like a GBM, it's sort of over 90% of them are going to have a histone mutation in the pons. If we look in the thalamus, um, we see that about 50% of high-grade astrocytomas in the, in the thalamus, and this is a pediatric population, about 50% of them are going to have the histone mutation. Um, but even within our low-grade astrocytomas, so something that looks like a diffuse astrocytoma grade 2, um, about 10% of them will have a histone mutation um, if it's present in that location. So it's important to think about it, and Ari mentioned this as well. It's important to think about it even if you have a low-grade um, glioma. And why is that important? This is the survival data. So this is for the pontine gliomas. Uh, so the red line being those with the histone mutation and the green line being those without the histone mutation. So eventually everybody with a pontine glioma generally dies. Um, but the survival for those with a histone mutation is very poor. So we have only a couple of patients surviving um, beyond two years who have that mutation. Um, and this is for the, the thalamus. Uh, so in the thalamus, if you have, uh, if you're wild type for that histone, this is all thalamic gliomas. Uh, then your overall survival is actually quite good. The median survival in our cases was 7.2 years, and if you have the histone mutation, median survival is less than a year. And if you break that out based on the histologic grade, um, of course, not surprisingly, high-grade histology in the thalamus is not good. Um, so both of these do, groups do quite poorly, um, but you see the couple of sort of longer-term survivors are those that have a wild-type histone. Those with the mutant histone, um, we had no survivors. In the low-grade histology, I think this is another important sort of take-home message. So without a histone mutation, our long-term survival of a thalamic low-grade glioma is almost 100%. It's over 95%. Whereas patients that had a histone mutation um, overall uh, do quite poorly. This is not a large number of cases. You will see that there are a couple of patients that are living longer. So one patient that lived about seven years and then a patient that lived closer to 14 years. Um, but in the end, they all succumb to their disease. And this is, um, you know, overall why we decided in, uh, in the WHO to give these diffuse midline gliomas a WHO grade four. So this is just showing where these are going to uh, pop up in the current classification. So again, this has been mentioned several times. There's this new category, diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M mutant. Um, the pediatric tumors are going to all fall into this IDH wild type group, um, and it sort of may be better pulled out as a separate. Uh, currently, the H3, G34R mutations are not um, at part of the classification, um, and so these will also fall into the IDH wild type group. So just to summarize then, the pediatric high-grade gliomas are usually IDH wild type and 1P19Q non-codeleted. Uh, they frequently will have histone mutations, H3K27M in the midline or G34R in the hemispheres. H3K27M is a useful marker for prognosis in midline gliomas. Um, obviously, the high grades do worse uh, uh, than the low grades, but even a low-grade astrocytoma with the K27M will do poorly.
Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the low-grade gliomas. So um, again, this is the most common CNS neoplasm in children. It's a histologically quite a diverse group. Uh, they can arise anywhere in the CNS, and their clinical course and outcome is actually quite variable. Here we're not really talking as much about survival, and it's more about progression-free survival and morbidity from the disease. So in terms of the revised WHO classification, the pediatric low-grade gliomas sort of go all over the place, and so I've just highlighted some of the places where these uh, may end up. Uh, a lot of the times in the clinical trials, they're sort of all lumped together in, in low-grade glioma trials. This is looking at sort of what are the relative frequency of these different um, entities. This is our sick kids um, cohort. So this is 873 uh, patients with low-grade glioma diagnosed at sick kids. Um, and so you'll see about a third of our cases are pilocytic astrocytoma, about 20% are ganglioglioma, and then we end up with about somewhere, you know, 15 to 20% of cases where we have the very tiny biopsy and, um, you know, you're not entirely sure if it's a pilocytic or a diffuse or something else, and so we end up calling them low-grade astrocytoma. And then you can see the other entities are in here, but they're relatively infrequent compared uh, to the, to sort of the big, the big ones. Now, what we know about the, the molecular um, features of low-grade gliomas um, is uh, largely related uh, to the RASMAP kinase pathway. So we've known, obviously, for a long time that NF1 patients are susceptible to low-grade gliomas. Um, and then a, a number of papers uh, have come out, and Charles also talked about this, uh, including papers from his group, um, which identified uh, these BRAF um, duplications where it gets fused to another gene called KIAA1549 um, and thought to be activating mutations. And then a second way that BRAF can be activated is through the V600E point mutation, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. Um, and so there was sort of, this is actually this picture which comes from uh, Dave, David Jones' uh, article in 2013 and I think uh, is actually on the front cover of the WHO book. Um, but I think one of the interesting things here is, you know, things evolve very quickly. So if we look at the percentage where we, of alterations that we think these are supposed to represent, um, BRF mutations here are listed at 5%. And I'll show you that actually if you look at, at a population-based series, it's considerably higher than that. And I, and I think that's important from a clinical perspective. So in addition to the BRAF alterations, there's been a number of NGS papers that have come out, um, both from uh, Keith Ligon's group as well as uh, the St. Jude group and Heidelberg, um, which have identified other less frequent alterations uh, within these pediatric tumors, um, and some of them enriched in particular types. So this, the MIB or MIB-L1 alterations, which we tend to see in pediatric diffuse astrocytomas relatively frequently, although that tumor entity as a whole is, is infrequent in pediatrics. Um, so I, th I think important about the molecular alterations in pediatric low-grade glioma and, and sort of already alluded to this a little bit in distinguishing between what are diagnostic markers and what are really prognostic or predictive markers. In contrast to the lower-grade gliomas of adults, these molecular alterations for, in pediatrics do not seem to be disease-defining. In other words, they're not diagnostic of a particular disease, and you can see them across a number of different morphologies. Um, but there is evidence that they may help predict the prognosis as well as the therapeutic response. And I'll just show you our data for that. So um, we looked at our series of patients at SickKids from 2000 and 2015 and identified about 450 patients with low-grade glioma. Uh, 37 of those we had to exclude because they didn't have enough tissue available. Um, so in the end, uh, we were able to evaluate 412, which represented 92%. We looked at BRAF v 600 e all of the BRAF fusions, the FGFR fusions, the MEBL1 uh, duplications, as well as the histone mutations. And when we look at our series, uh, we see that overall 38% of our low-grade gliomas are BRAF fusion positive, and 17% of our tumors show V600E. If we break that down by location, um, you see there's some interesting patterns, and again, I think this has been alluded to. So if you have a low-grade glioma in the cerebellum, 80% chance that it's going to harbor a, a BRAF fusion. Uh, whereas if you flip over to the hemispheres, you see that a third of them will actually have the mutation, and the fusion is much less frequent. And then if we look in the midline, it's about a quarter with the mutation and about a third with the fusion. And then here we start to pick up this H3K27M mutation in the low-grade gliomas as well. <clears throat> 
If we look by pathology, um, we see again there are some interesting associations, but I think highlighting the fact that these are not disease defining. So if you have something that histologically looks like a pilocytic astrocytoma, then 70% chance it's going to have a BRAF fusion and only about 5% chance it's going to have the mutation. Whereas if we jump to something like a PXA, uh, here 85% of our cases had a BRAF uh, mutation. And similarly, over 50% of our cases that were called ganglioglioma had a BRAF mutation. If we look at this versus um, survival, so this is progression-free survival, and I'm comparing it with our NF1 patients here where who generally have indolent disease, as, as Charles had said. So if you have NF1 with a low-grade glioma, 10-year progression-free survival was 83% in our cohort. If you had a BRAF fusion, 10-year progression-free survival was about 50%. And if you had the V600E mutation, 10-year progression-free survival was only about 20%. If we look at survival, um, we see, again, sort of an interesting pattern. So here's the NF1 patients in blue. You probably can barely see this brown. This is the BRAF-fused patients. So basically, the NF1 and the BRAF-fused patients, in terms of overall survival, um, do very similarly. So around 95% overall survival for those patients. So basically, this is telling you the BRAF fused patients might progress, but they don't tend to eventually die of their disease. In other words, these very rarely, and it happens, but they very rarely will transform or behave in a very malignant way. Um, on the other hand, the BRAF E600E patients, you see if you're looking sort of out at five or even 10 years, they still seem to be doing relatively well. But what we start to see with those patients is as we get out into the 15 or the 20 year uh, timeline, um, we start to see these patients are dying from their disease. And there seems to be a bigger susceptibility for these V600E mutant patients to acquire um, additional hits like P16 deletion um, and undergo transformation. And some of the epithelioid GBM patients we may be seeing are actually, I'd say, a late manifestation of a transformed um, low-grade glioma in pediatrics. So why is that important? So from a clinical perspective, it's important to identify these patients because they actually um, don't respond the same way to our current therapies. So this is showing you our BRAF thesis 100E patients who either had a gross total resection um, or did not have a gross total resection. And you'll see that they actually do a little bit better if they get a complete surgery, but overall their progression-free survival is still not great. And if we look at their response to radiation, similarly, it's not as good. So this is just a comparison cohort. This is Tom Merchant's study, um, low-grade glioma um, response to radiation. So this is what we would expect. So we would expect about a 10-year, 75% progression-free survival for patients who received radiation for low-grade glioma. If we look at our V600E patients, we're only seeing a 28% progression-free survival at 10 years. Same thing with, with traditional chemotherapy. So we would expect about a five-year progression-free survival of 45% in patients treated with chemo, and we're down at 25% for the V600E patients. Um, how, and this is just showing in our own cohort, um, blue being patients who received one line of chemo, green two lines, and three, uh, or, or pink three lines. Um, and overall, the response rate to traditional chemotherapy in our cohort was only about 10%. However, um, and this is a study we've been running now for a couple of years at SickKids, which is using targeted agents, and again, um, Charles mentioned uh, some of the targeted agents that can be used for BRAF V600E. Um, so the orange are the patients that received a targeted V600E agent, and the blue are the patients that received um, just a regular uh, first-line chemotherapy. Um, and you can see that when these BRAF E600E patients actually received an agent targeted to V600E, uh, the response rate is substantially better than if they're uh, receiving traditional um, chemotherapy. So in terms of um, identifying patients for particular therapies, finding the BRAF E600E is very important. So to summarize then the low-grade glioma, uh, BRAF alterations are present in about overall 60% of patients. Um, other alterations are, include MIB, MIB-L1, and FGFR, which only account for about 
Uh, we see overall about 40% of the patients will have a BRAF fusion. This is most frequent in the cerebellum and then the midline and least frequent in the hemispheres. And in terms of pathology, you're most likely going to see that in a pilocytic astrocytoma, less likely in a ganglioglioma, and least likely in a diffuse astrocytoma, um, to the point where it, it, you may even consider not calling something a diffuse astrocytoma if it has a BRAF fusion. Uh, V600E is present in about 20% of cases. These are most frequent in the hemispheres and next in the midline and relatively infrequent in the cerebellum. Uh, these are most commonly associated with PXA and ganglioglioma, um, with pilocytic astrocytomas only being about 5% of those. These have a more aggressive clinical course and they have a poor response to current therapies, uh, but may have a better response to targeted inhibitors, so it's something that's um, important to think about. And in terms of um, how that's changed the practice at sick kids is now we're much more likely to biopsy patients with low-grade glioma uh, just to determine if they actually have a V600E mutation because it will change the way the patients are treated um, in terms of their frontline therapy. And I think, you know, finally, it's important that um, we report both what the histology looks like as well as these molecular alterations because I think we still don't know how those two are going to interact. Do we know, um, you know, does a ganglioglioma with V600E do worse than a wild-type ganglioglioma? And I think we're going to need large cohorts to really parse out those things and probably do uh, multi-institutional studies. Um, and that's it. Thank you.